Hey, welcome back everyone to another episode of Health Sparks featuring the brightest entrepreneurs and innovations from the health and technology arena. I am Michael Walsh, your host. So glad you could stop by and join us today. Great guest. It's uh, my good buddy, Steve Diesfeld, uh, who is uh, a certified professional in healthcare quality. We're going to talk a bunch about uh, patient safety, healthcare innovation, all the stuff going on right now, like in terms of uh, the healthcare environment with the Affordable Care Act and some of Steve's thoughts uh, and wrap up a bit with just kind of what he's most excited about as we look forward to everything happening right now and all the changes going on, uh, what it really means for everybody. So uh, excited to welcome Steve to the show. Uh, again, Steve, good buddy of mine. I've known him for a long, long time. Uh, in the interest of just making sure everybody's aware, uh, Steve is the co-founder of Caraloop with me. So uh, wanted to make sure everybody was aware of this, but we're not going to be chatting about Caroloop at all today. Uh, he, again, is a resident expert in healthcare quality, so wanted to make sure that we could share some of the, uh, the good stuff inside his head with all of you. So uh, again, excited you could be here today. Uh, before we get started with Steve, a quick reminder as always to subscribe to HealthSparks. You can do so right here on the website uh, up above, or you can go to healthsparks.com forward slash subscribe. Just my way uh, each week of sending you uh, all these these great episodes, all these fantastic interviews with the healthcare experts and entrepreneurs of the world. Uh, it, no spam, I, I promise it's not going to be anything like that. I know people get a little uh, hesitant to put their email to anything these days because they get so much, but promise no spam, just my way of getting the stuff to you. So please sign up, that'd be great. Uh, and of course, we're available on both iTunes and Stitcher Radio, so you know, check us out on your iPhones and things like that. Uh, and then, of course, last but not least, want to give uh, one last quick uh, shout out. I, it's been a while, actually, so I, maybe I shouldn't say one last quick shout out, but uh, Satori Tech Solutions. It's been a while since I've given them some love. Uh, they do so much great stuff for us for, for Health Sparks, for Health 2 Dallas, for Caraloop, uh, for another project I'm involved with called the IX Summit. These are great folks here in Dallas. They do all sorts of Fantastic work for uh, web development, mobile development, uh, SEO, PPC, social media. I mean, you name it. If you have a technology need, uh, you definitely want to give these guys a buzz. So uh, if you want an introduction, just get a hold of me here on the website and I can make that happen for you. Or you can check them out at satoritechsolutions.com. So without further ado, let's get, in, uh, get, let's get into things with Steve. Hi, everybody. Today on Health Sparks, I am joined by one of my lifelong buddies. Me and this guy, we've known each other for about 20 years or so now. I and mean, we played Little League together. I was best man in his wedding. Uh, we go back a long ways. It's Steve Thiesfeld. Uh, real quick, before we get started with Steve, I want to quick go over his bio. Steve worked for Sunrise Senior Living as a caregiver and manager from 2004 to 2009. Now, in his last role at Sunrise, he actually worked to turn around uh, multiple communities up in Minnesota by increasing their occupancy and improving their quality. Through all of these experiences at Sunrise, he began to envision a better way for geriatric care and service companies to better reach their customers. And this is what was the original idea for what is now Caraloop, the company that both Steve and I founded. So in addition to being a, co a Caraloop co-founder, Steve currently holds a Certified Professional in Healthcare Quality, or CPHQ designation and is doing a bunch of work right now for Denver-based CFMC as a quality improvement consultant. And as I sit here and talk, it sounds like Steve fell off of his chair. So, <laughs> Steve, what's up, buddy? How are you? Oh, I'm great. I'm still on my chair, believe it or not. <laughs> so, yes, perhaps it's a fan that I have going on in the background. So I will get up out of my chair and turn that fan off. So How are you today, sir? I'm good. So, again, people listening, Steve and I go back a long way. Uh, full discla disclaimer, full disclosure here, we did found Caraloop together, but that's not what we're going to talk about today. Steve is an expert in healthcare quality, patient safety. Uh, th these are big buzzwords right now. And a lot of the episodes I've been recording lately have been geared a lot more towards patients and things that they can be thinking about. So I thought this was a perfect time to bring Steve on to chat about some of this stuff. So... Uh, let's kick things off a little bit. So take us back to maybe like 2006, 2007 up in Minnesota uh, when you're working at Sunrise. Uh, what did things look like inside the walls of one of these assisted living or memory care facilities in terms of quality care and patient safety? You know, the, the biggest thing that I think I took away from my time at the assisted living when it came to quality care and safety were that you know, the people that work for these organizations they really do want to provide the best care that they possibly can for the people living in them. So, you know, the biggest thing is you want to take care of the people that are living with you. As a caregiver, you don't want to be 
in charge of a resident that you know falls you don't want to feel like you did something wrong so you're going you're going to do your best to take care of the people that you've kind of been entrusted with right um from an organizational perspective you know the state came in and conducted their you know annual surveys i know sometimes that the states uh have kind of been challenged with the number of staff they have uh, to the number of assisted livings that were being built during that time. So the surveys were not, um, you know, conducted like on a specific annual like basis. It was kind of just as your certifications came up, you were inspected. Sure. Uh, went through that a couple times. Um, you know, uh, we were fortunate enough that we uh, ran a very good building, so I didn't get to experience a uh, truly poor inspection. Uh, and then from a, a corporate standpoint, we had an internal quality team that came around to each of the uh, facilities and, you know, conducted reviews of our internal processes, uh, how we took care of our employees, uh, how well uh, we provided resident care, um, you know, safety from a facility standpoint as well. Um, and that was a team that traveled just kind of around the country assessing the uh, the performance of the the various properties, and you know, you got rated just like in grade school on your one hundred point scale. <laughs> so everybody was trying to get an A. <laughs> was that standard that most people didn't? Um, yeah, it was. Kind of, it was probably very similar to uh, every other classroom that we had. <laughs> you know, fortunately, I don't think it was the case that you know, like in your organic chemistry classes in college, the average grade was a thirty-five percent, and then you got a uh, a rounding based based on the curve. <laughs> but, say, uh, huh? say, uh, who who uh, who was setting the curve for sunrise? You know, like, who's getting the uh, the nasty gram emails every year that oh, you know, you jerks are showing us all up. <laughs> You know, we were very fortunate in uh, our state to have some very high-performing uh, properties that pretty much consistently scored in the top, you know, ten percent at least. So again, you know, those are A's. Right. Now we like we, we like A's. Yeah. Now this is something that I haven't really talked a whole lot about on the show. So you know, assisted living is still relatively a newer concept. I mean, compared to you know a lot of the other models out there, skilled nursing and some of these. So. Uh, for those who might not be aware, just kind of walk us through what what makes an assisted living provider different from a skilled nursing facility. That is a fantastic question. Uh, as assisted living facilities have been around for longer and longer, um, in my in my opinion, from the the views that I've had going into many of them, uh, there's not much that separates the two anymore. Um, the two big things uh, that you see when you look at assisted livings, which is skilled nursing facilities, are, you know, who's paying for the care, for one. Uh, a lot of the times in skilled nursing facilities, it's kind of like the bridge between hospitals and and home or like an assisted living facility. Right. So a lot of that is covered by uh, you know, federal programs like Medicaid or Medicare versus assisted livings, which are frequently covered by people's checking accounts yeah. <laughs> and savings accounts and investment accounts. So it's more private pay base. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so the payment mechanism is generally different. And then the type of care that's needed, you know, assisted living, you know, 20 years ago before I ever got into that business was very similar to what like an independent living would be like today where, you know, the, the residents didn't need a lot of help. Uh, they didn't maybe need help getting to the bathroom yeah, real hands or off. brushing their teeth. Yeah, it was more hands off, yeah. I think. Um, and, you know, as as the population has aged and changed and all that stuff, the need for the services has risen. And obviously there's a, a market of people willing to pay for that. Otherwise, assisted living wouldn't have grown the way it has. Right. Um, so now you're seeing a lot of residents that, you know, 20 years ago, that would have been in, you know, like a nursing home or a skilled nursing facility uh, in assisted livings. Yeah. So the, the care in skilled nursing facilities now is more focused on, you know, really patients or residents that need 24-hour nursing care or, you know, more complex uh, care with, like, for example, uh, comor comorbidities. So, you know, do they have diabetes and hypertension and 15 other things. Right. Just, you know, they might be better suited for skilled just nursing facilities. Too much for an assisted living provider and staff of caregivers to take on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. A lot more licensed staff in skilled nursing facilities. Sure. So, uh, how did you, you know, you were kind of put in a position back then, I remember, um, of 
walking into some of these communities and really being tasked with like you need to get a bunch more people in, in here and you need to really sort of raise the bar as far as the quality goes. So how did you personally, when you were in this situation, help improve the experience for a patient or a resident? You know, a lot of it just came down to, you know, communication between the patients or residents, between the residents' family members, and then with, uh, you know, the team members and staff at the assisted living. You know, for families, going through, so, you know, the building that I, I had an opportunity, I started off in Minnesota working at a very uh, well-run, uh, high-performing assisted living, so I got to understand the processes of how, how that all worked. And then I got to move on to another uh, location that was in need of some, you know, process redesigns and uh, some more engagement with the, the families and with the, the team. Mm-hmm. So, you know, engaging the families in that change, you know, you need to be able to communicate that you understand that there's dissatisfaction, you know, identifying what those those pain points are that they're not satisfied with, and then coming up with a solution to solve them. And to do all that, you need to communicate. So I think a lot of the work done to improve uh, in that location was really just communication, you know, consistent meeting with the families, calling them up, letting them know when something didn't go well and why and how we're working to fix it. Now, I got to believe that you were one of the youngest people in this position at the time, right? I mean, compared to your sister facilities, I mean, you were you're in your mid-20s at this point, whereas some of the people in that same position might have been, what, in their 40s or 50s? I was pretty young. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm guessing that your approach to making sure that the communication was there and that all this was in place was a bit different than some of your counterparts. Sure. Yeah. We, you know, we did a lot of email with family members, obviously not sharing, you know, HIPAA type material, right. but, you know, just letting them know that if they ever had a question, they could email me, especially, you know, that was like during the time when the iPhones kind of kicked in and everybody was using their Blackberries. Right. So, you know, during the workday, if they had a question, they could email, you know, I'd be able to respond pretty quick. Um, so that was really good for engaging the families. And then, you know, on the, the staffing side, you know, it's, it's the two pieces that you always have to balance. You have to, you know, make sure that your customer is happy and the customer is the family and the resident. But to do that, you know, as a supervisor, you need to make sure your team's in place and, you know, they have what they need to do their job well. So walking into that building, you know, we wanted to make sure that the team had the tools they needed to do their job. Right. You know, you don't want to have, you know, an understaffed building. Um, so you want to make sure you have the right amount of, of employees to take care of the people that you have. Because if you do, then they have more time to not only care for the residents in a, you know, like a physical way to meet their healthcare needs, but they can focus on other things too, like, you know, connecting more on a, you know, entertainment level or a more emotional level, things like that. Right. Okay. So let's, let's fast forward now a little bit. So, you know, you've had this great experience working in this, this healthcare environment, you're learning a lot, but at the same time, you know, the environment has been kind of changing around you as you're doing this. The Affordable Care Act was put in place in what, 2009, 2010, uh, you know, so President Obama yep. getting reelected here in 2012, it so that kind of solidified that this this was, in fact, going to get carried out. You know, the Supreme Court had backed it. Now Obama's been reelected. It's not going anywhere. So while all this is happening around you, what's your reaction to all this? Like, do you feel at the time and even now present that this is going to be a good thing, what our country's going through, like this shift? That is a fantastic question. I think that first and foremost... My biggest fear is is always, you know, you invest a whole bunch of time and money to, to put something in place. And what happens if somebody just turns around and says, well, we're not going to do that anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, talk about a waste of funds and materials. Sure. Right? That's not very, it's not very efficient. You and I, you know, always talking about efficiency. That's a complete description of inefficiency. Right. <laughs> um, so, you know, I was glad to see that you know, at least things were going to continue as opposed to completely revert back and, you know, three years will have done absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, But on a bigger picture, you know, we know the system is broken, right? Our health care for GDP in the U.S. is gigantic compared to other nations, other, you know, industrial nations. What is it? Like, isn't it like 15% or something like that? Like, oh, it's high. I can't remember the exact number. I know it's greater than 10. I think it's probably like 12 or something like that. Um, And that's just the spending, you know, that's the the dollars spent, right? 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, I always think back. I, I love to equate situations and things to movies. And, you know, I think back to uh, Lincoln, which is a movie I absolutely love. And you think about the U.S. over time, and, you know, you've had to make a lot of decisions, right? A lot of big decisions have come out of this country. And, you know, these decisions, you know, some people love them, some people hate them. Right. But, you know, that's that's part of the job of the government is to, you know, make a decision and move. So for me, I was glad to see that, you know, it's happening. I don't think we'll know the true effects of it for, you know, years to come. Right. But at least it's, you know, it's consistent. Yeah. So, I mean, you'll go ahead. I was going to say, and, we, and you, we've talked about this. I mean, it's uh, there's no way. I mean, there is as many haters out there as there are of the whole thing, we're not going to really know for years. You know, that's the thing. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> There's people that are doing all sorts of uh, downplaying and uh, kicking dirt all over the whole thing, but they really don't have a whole lot of grounds yet to do so. They're just sort of looking at what they think are accurate projections and basing opinion off of it. But, you know, the 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 truth of the matter is, and I just read this last week, and I think I remember sending you this article, like, you know, things are at least from a number standpoint, improving. Costs are starting to come down. The readmission rates are starting to come down. So at least for what this whole thing stood for when it was put together back, you know, a couple of years ago and where it's currently going, I mean, at least from the basic preliminary numbers, it does look like it's starting to go in the right direction. Yeah, I did see those reports. Yeah. Yeah, it, it does seem that way. And again, it, it comes down to, we know it's broken. It, all you can do is try. Right, absolutely. You know, use your... Use your best your best efforts and you know adapt as things come in. Sure. So let's chat a little bit about patients and families there. I mean, because we were we've been talking about that all along. Your experience at Sunrise and what all this legislation is going to mean for patients and families. So what can these folks do, you know, today in 2013 to better navigate all this chaos going on in our healthcare system? You know, I think one of the biggest things is to just ask questions. You know, I've been, you could consider it fortunate or unfortunate to have spent a, a little bit of time in hospitals and, you know, clinic settings over the last year. And, you know, we're all human. Even physicians are human. Nurses are human. You know, schedulers are human. <laughs> patients are human. Families are human. We're not perfect. So we're working in an imperfect system trying to make it as good and as safe and is as easy to navigate as possible. So from a from a family and you know patient standpoint or resident standpoint, you know, ask questions. Like if you're in a hospital and you're not sure what drug you're getting, ask. Right. If you go in to, to look at an assisted living, say for your grandma, you know, ask to see their state survey or something like that and ask questions based on what you read. And you know, just get out there and look. It's no different than you know, looking for a, a car. Right. Like you're going to go do your research. You're probably going to do your research online. You're probably going to go to a couple dealerships. You're probably going to drive a few cars. And then based on all that, you'll make your decision. Right. And I mean, that, that in this metaphor, the car agency or the dealership is not offended if you ask, you know, some basic questions about who they are and what they do. You know, like they'd be very happy to answer those questions for you, just like an assisted living facility or a hospital would be. Like, yeah, it's just part of doing your due diligence, right? Exactly. They probably would look at you like you were crazy if you just walked in and said, "Hey, I want this car." Yeah, you know, and even <laughs> even the most educated healthcare people, to your point a second ago, don't know everything. You yeah. know, like there's no way to know every single thing about every single diagnosis or condition out there, and how the insurance is going to handle it, and how the hospital is going to handle it, and all of the, the variables that come up during this process. Absolutely. So, you know, that being said, then, uh, you know, there is there are a lot of tools that are being built right now. There's this huge innovation wave coming through healthcare to make things better for the patients, the consumers that have to sort of be empowered to take over and, and manage their health. So w what's your opinion on this? What role can technology really play in improving how healthcare functions? <laughs> I think that it will, obviously, with the advent of our smartphones and everybody holding iPhones and Android phones and stuff, you know, we, we do have the ability to take care of it all, right, from our hands. Mm -hmm. um, I think that one of the most important pieces will be making it, the technology, extremely 
easy for people to use. Right. You know, think think about taking care of yourself. We all know we should go to the gym, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. We all we all know that if you take care of your body, you're more likely to not have health issues versus not. Mm-hmm. But you know, for some people, it's easier to get to the gym than others. Yeah. So I think you know. Using all this technology, it's great. It's all coming out. You know, there's lots of opportunities, obviously, in the system. I was just going to actually I, ask, what's your favorite opportunity right now? Oh, you know what? Gracious. What what improvements are just absolutely dying to be made from what you've seen? I mean, I know, I know there's I, there's a ton, right? But I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah, there are a ton. I I really like. Uh, I know you had a kind nexus on one of your uh, mm-hmm. your calls, and. You know, I think that's incredible what they're doing. Like, you know, quality, performance improvement, lean, all that kind of stuff is happening across the healthcare system. And, you know, they've built a platform where anybody can say, hey, this is what I think we can do to improve. Like, that's that's really cool. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm interested to see uh, the whole smartwatch concept come out uh-huh. just because I think that'll be a really good tracking mechanism. I know like for my family, we have a history of high cholesterol. You know, I'd be interested in monitoring all my, my heart stuff to try to keep myself healthy. And that seems like it'd be cool. And then from a, like an assisted living and skilled nursing facility standpoint, I think I haven't seen uh, the sensor technology kind of put into place yet, but I think it'd be very interesting to, to kind of monitor and map the care that's provided to, you know, these residents and, you know, you can learn a lot from somebody's habits and to be able to track those habits. And obviously you need to be aware of like privacy and safety stuff. Yeah. Um, but I think that could be, you know, that could be extremely beneficial. Think about it. If you know, somebody's trying to get up and out of their bed at two o'clock every morning, you know, in an assisted living, that should indicate a, you know, a light bulb going off in your head saying this person is probably trying to go to the bathroom or, you know, if they have dementia, maybe they they get more confused around that time. Right. And you know, if they have gait issues, that would be a, you know the time they're at highest risk for fall. Mm-hmm. So to be able to track that, you know, that ties into you know everything. You're you're giving your customers additional services that they wouldn't necessarily expect because of this technology. You as a you know caregiver are more enabled and more empowered to do the work you need to do to take care of your residents. Um, as a company, you're you're better able to please your customers. From a systems perspective, you you know don't have to admit somebody to the hospital because you actually took care of them before something happened. Uh-huh. So there's cost savings there. So I think that's that technology is pretty cool too. So uh, taking a thirty thousand foot look at the whole thing now, I mean we've talked about a bunch here. Um, let's just say over the next like three to five years, let's just talk about for a second. Uh, what are you most excited about here as all this change sets in, as all this technology gets put in place, as the patients and the families do a better job of asking questions and what, what would you consider to be, if you had to, you know, pick out something, what would you call a victory in the next three to five years for healthcare? <sighs> To see it all start working together, I think I think seeing it all kind of come together, and you know, I was just at a meeting two weeks ago, and you've got hospital systems, and you've got you know skilled nursing facilities, you've got home health agencies, all kind of in the same area talking about the same thing, and you know that wouldn't always be the case. Like I know that was not the case necessarily when I started out in assisted living. Mm-hmm. So to see all that come together, and to see you know those providers engaging with residents and patients and family members, you know, it's, healthcare seems like it's starting to become more, um, more focused on the community, I guess I would say. Yeah. Less, you know, as opposed to siloed, you know, it's all, it's all kind of ingraining together now because we're realizing we just all use so much of it that it all needs to work together. Yeah. I mean, the, so obviously technology will play a huge role. In right. Like kind of like you know. done are the days of you going to the hospital and, they, you know, keep a record of what happens to you there. And then, you know, again, like we, we live in a global economy now where sometimes I move a lot, I do a lot in other, other places. And now all of a sudden I'm in a different place and I need my, my data, my records and like done are the days where it's going to be okay to just like hold those things hostage. And it, like you said, it's becoming more of a community effort to make sure that people get the help they need. 
Yeah, exactly. So, all right. Well, this has been good stuff. I mean, just kind of a quick closing question. Um, you know, and you kind of touched on it probably a little bit with what you were saying about patients and families asking questions, but uh, more of a broader sense to all all stakeholders, not just patients, families, but entrepreneurs or industry professionals. What advice do you have for people out there as they sort of work through the pain points of our nation's healthcare system? <clears throat> uh, take a look at it from a system perspective. You know, don't don't look at it just as you know this is one market as as an entrepreneur. This is one thing that I'm going to absolutely focus on. Look at it from okay, this is this is what I want to do. What else could that potentially affect? Right. And the same thing from a, you know, from the consumer standpoint, like this is what I need, but where else does it all tie in? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that uh, for everybody involved, again, it goes back to the word you just used community. Um, you know, the more you could make this community based and team based, you know, the better the outcomes could be for, for everybody. You know, the more money yeah. businesses can make, the better, better outcomes and experiences the patients and the families have. Just it goes on and on. So, yeah, if there's some if there's some way for everybody to work together and benefit, I think I think that will drive it forward. Awesome. Well, uh, this has been great. I mean, it was just just as awesome as I expected it to be. This is all good stuff for people to be thinking about. Um, and of course, you know, you and I talk on a, on a daily basis, so I would hope that we'd be able to get you on, you know, some more and just chat some more about the issues and where things are headed because uh, there's a lot happening right now, and I think a lot of people are asking questions, good questions that we might be able to help answer you and I together. So. Uh, thanks for taking the time, man. Really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, buddy. Okie dokie. That'll about do it for Steve and I. Before we sign off, just a, a quick reminder as always, please subscribe here on the website or go to healthsparks.com forward slash subscribe. Uh, my way of every Tuesday morning as I post the episodes, just delivering them straight to you with a little bit of a description about what the episode was about, who the guest was, uh, and all the great stuff that uh, that came up during the, the 25 minutes we had together. So please, please, please subscribe. I would very much appreciate it. Uh, and of course, we're available on iTunes and Stitcher Radio as well. So check us out in those forums. So hope everybody's had a good week so far. Uh, until next time, I'm your host, Michael Walsh. We'll talk to you soon.